I knew that when she started editing me at age 16, I think it was, I knew that it wouldn't be long before I was actually following in her footsteps. And I kind of think that's what I'm doing right now here with Ran. Um, but I love Ran in my own right as well. And I have to say, Randy and I, we go way, way back. Um, but I am just incredibly honored to be asked here tonight and to share this with Anna. Um, I uh, also I wanted to mention that in the sense of not being a newcomer, I feature um, Ran in a book I wrote in 2006 called Democracy's Edge. So I think I can say I, I love Ran because both of the main passions of my life, food and democracy, uh, are very, very strong currents, of course, in the work that I see us celebrating tonight. And I so want to reinforce what Anna just said about how important it is that people understand the role of our monopoly-controlled food system in deforestation, in climate change. And I credit Rand so much with that understanding now. You know, also I realize that for me, the response to Diet for a Small Planet I honestly expected it to appeal to about 500 people in the greater Bay Area. <laughs> and, and we're here, huh? <laughs> well, <laughs> actually, my dad was the only one who believed in it at that time. But, um, you know, what that book taught me more than it, well, taught me many things. But the response to Diet for a Small Planet taught me how much people want to find meaning in their everyday choices, right? And that, that's what I wanted, and that's, I think, why um, people responded the way they have. And so, you know, I think about Rand's campaign on palm oil, and it's so similar to me in the potential, in the incredible potential to enable people to say, oh, yes, here's something I can do that makes enormous difference in saving rainforests and in protecting species. And so I think that this Snack Food 20, I think this conflict palm oil ban, I think that this is such a brilliant pathway that everyone can connect to, and the ripples can be just unbelievable. Um, the other... As you know, my, my passion in life, food slash hunger, very much why hunger in a world of plenty. And so I so appreciate RAN because uh, I see you protecting the food supply of some of our planet's poorest people. Do you know that 80% of the people living in developing countries have health and nutrition needs met in part by the forest? 80%. And so I see Rand's work very much in directly, directly supporting the lives of people who are the poorest and yet in some ways among the most privileged because they are near the forest. So that is part of my passion. Um, also, my democracy and food passions come together in my um, just in in being entranced with uh, the community managed forest movement, uh, which is very significant in India. And it means that people in their own villages taking responsibility for protecting the forest, which is what then Rand's work helps make possible. And I was just so impressed to learn that 30% of the population in Nepal is now actively engaged in this community level forest protection, 30%. And it covers, their protecting activities cover 25% of the areas in forest in Nepal. I find that so encouraging. So I love RAN because your mission is so aligned with my missions, but your methods also, and they can't be separated from one another. Because I feel that you all have an instinctive grasp of what I love to call the arts of democracy the arts of democracy that include the kind of brilliant negotiation that uh, we heard Lindsay talking about. 
uh, but also include listening and include celebrating. Celebrating is definitely an art of democracy. And so I, I so appreciate that dimension of RAN. And of course, one key art of democracy is listening. It is by listening that you may actually discover that insider who is a human being uh, who has begun to be concerned him or herself and just needs you, Rand, to keep pushing to give them the cover to do what they really want to do. And so I believe that you combine that then with a very strong sense, it's kind of in the DNA of RAN, of appreciating what I think of as citizens' power, a part of what I call living democracy, as not something we have, but what we do. Drawing in hundreds of thousands of people, giving them a chance to make history. And so in that vein, in my 2006 book, Democracy's Edge, I included a story that the former executive director had, had shared with me um, that kind of touches on a number of these things, but he, he said that in the early uh, Home Depot campaign, which became very large, Mike Bruin told me that um, he met a man, a, a manager, who said, I make a good living, but I don't want to be on the wrong side of history. I want to take my daughters to Ecuador to see the rainforest. I want it to be there. How can I help? And well, the story from Mike was that you can help by giving us the secret intercom code for Home Depot. <laughs> and ran, ran with it. And soon shoppers in Home Depot were hearing a surprise intercom message that was, attention shoppers, there's a special on aisle three on products made from endangered old growth forest. Home Depot was not amused. <laughs> but thousands engaged in that 1999 campaign, and with then, ultimately, that fax came, Mike said, from Home Depot when they uh, shifted their position. They uh, agreed to stop this. Um, and then I think something like nine other companies, at least, came on board after that. So, yes. I love it. To get beyond the margin to make history, as Rand is doing, you have to think big. And as Lindsay said to me recently, Frankie, you have to believe big. <laughs> and I love that too. And what I mean by that, and I think Lindsay means by that, is that you have to believe that your cause, your demands, make so much sense that ultimately they have to prevail. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, when I'm thinking about looking at all the kind of campaigns you all have done and taking on the banks, I mean, certainly the Obama administration didn't think you could take on the banks, right? But you guys have. And, and you know, a class of people who are accused, and I kind of sympathize with the accusation that, that you know, these are people who think they rule the universe, and yet, they could still be vulnerable to a RAND campaign? Yes, indeed. Yeah. And so, the latest number, what was it, eight of the biggest Wall Street banks issued policies that limited uh, their financing of mountaintop removal coal mining? I mean, that's huge. Huge, huge, huge. So, I also love RAND because you don't play on guilt and fear, which is often the easy, but never really, I think, long-term, it doesn't work. And what I mean by that is that, to me, the core message of RAND is not, you should, you should, it is, we can. And increasingly, it's not just we can, it's, we've done it, we've done it, come join us. That is so much more motivating, right, than any of this. And so I just so appreciate uh, that spirit that doesn't play on fear and guilt. And finally, I just want to share with you uh, how my life has been changed in the last few years. As I, I, 
got into writing a book that ultimately became, became Eco Mind. And it came out of a sense that many environmental messages weren't having the effect that we wanted them to have, and they were still locked into a negative mechanical worldview, I think of it. And so what I see RAN representing is the shift to me, uh, shedding this worldview that is still locked. I finally got it down to three uh, letters here. OK. Three Cs. Um, no, sorry. I find that's the answer. The problem are the three S's. OK, the mechanical worldview. <laughs> sorry. Uh, it, it's late in Boston now. Um, the, the, the shift that I see that RAN is so powerfully contributing to is from a worldview that is locked in an assumption of separateness, of stasis, that things really can't be changed, and of scarcity. Oh, there's not enough for us. What is emerging and what I see RAND expressing is what I call the eco-mind, which all of science now is confirming, that no, 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 it's not the three S's. It's, it is connectedness, continuous change, and therefore co-creation. We are all co-creators. And I have a dear friend in Germany, Hans-Peter Durer, a physicist, on this. He, in a conversation about this, he said, in other words, Frankie, in biological systems, in reality, there are no parts, there are only participants. So, what does that mean? It means that the only choice we don't have is whether to change the world. Everything we are doing is changing it. The question is, how do we? How do we? And so, I, I sense then that out of this understanding of continuous change, in which we are all co-creators because we're all connected, uh, that it is, as we've heard from Anna, from Lindsay, we've heard that, that yes, there is no way that, that things can happen very quickly and unexpectedly. We, we do not know. But I believe that from an ecological perspective, there is one thing we do know, and that is that it's not possible to know what's possible. If it's not possible to know what's possible, we are free. We are free to go for that world that we all want. And you know what? I think that Rand figured this out a long time before I did. Thank you so much. <laughs>